packed with cooking tips, information and 100 recipes to stake your life on. Right, now it's all about outstanding brunches. I love brunch. It's a great way of relaxing with friends and family, not taking yourself or anything else too seriously. And brunch dishes should reflect that. Spicy, sweet or savoury, anything goes. And one of my all-time favourites, a dish that always creates a stir, is the daddy of all brunches, steak sandwiches. For me, the secret of a great brunch is fun and casual. Fuss-free cooking and everyone helping themselves. This is the ultimate steak sandwich. You want the Rolls Royce of beef. It has to be fillet. Now, season it beautifully. I like to open up the top of the pepper mill to increase the size of the pepper in the steak so it gives that bit of heat. Nice little chunks. You just roll now nicely all the way around. Now, slice the garlic in half. Pan nice and hot. Olive oil in. Hold the steak and just place it into the pan. Don't drop it. At the front of the pan, we're going to tilt the pan forward to cook the back of the steak, dual purpose. Now, roll it back and sear underneath. Next, my garlic. And roast that garlic. Thyme. Fry that thyme. I want to hear it. We're not looking for a lot of colour because you're going to dry out the fillet. So, just one end, turn it back down, and sear the other end in. Lift up your thyme, place it on top of the garlic. There. Lift up your fillet and sit that on top of your garlic. Butter in. Take a spoon, tilt the pan gently, lift up and baste. I've got that scented garlic thyme flavour. The steak's going to cook evenly because it's sat on a little, a little bed in the oven for eight to ten minutes. Pan on. For the relish, you think of a steak sandwich, you think of a sort of nice heated tomato relish. To make the relish, finely dice a red onion. Three finger rule. One in front, two behind. Through and chop. Wow. Next, roughly chop a chilli, keeping the seeds in for extra heat. Start off with the olive oil into a pan. Onions, chilli. Generous with the olive oil. I want a nice sort of rich, silky relish. From there, take your tomatoes. You can just use red tomatoes, but these yellow and red make the perfect combination. Now, put your salt in, pepper, and then roast those tomatoes off. Take a wooden spoon and just sort of break them up. Once the skin's blister, the whole tomato just starts to release all that really nice, sweet texture. A little teaspoon of sherry vinegar. Gives that nice acidic balance to the sweetness of the tomatoes. Turn down the gas and just let them sort of stew perfectly. Now, a steak sandwich would not be complete unless it had the most amazing mustard mayonnaise. Simply add three tablespoons of mayonnaise to three teaspoons of whole grain mustard. Now I've got the relish almost down to like a really nice jam. Now, I want to make that relish a little bit more fragrant. Some basil. Slice it through and sprinkle that basil in there. Mmm. Beautiful. Look at this. There she is. My crown jewels. Time to take it out. The smell is incredible. And just baste one more time and fill it. Touch is quite soft in the centre, so it's just coming up to mid-rare. Let it rest 
the same time you cooked it. And it would be nice and pink evenly throughout the steak. To make my sandwich, I'm going to char grill some sliced jupatta bread. Season it nicely. Just a little drizzle of olive oil. I want to get that bread nice and crispy. Pan, nice and hot. Bread in. Push it down. Smell is amazing, that char, sort of charcoal flavour. Once you've got those marks on the bread, it just stops the bread from becoming soggy. And look at this here. It is stunning. On. Slice it gently. One beautiful slice. Wow. It's nice and pink all the way through. And the beef is so soft. It's almost like slicing through butter. Let the knife do the work. Take a little bit of mayonnaise, spread that with the back of the spoon on both sides. Next, lettuce. Take that beautiful slice of beef. Oh, and then relish on top of that beef and just slice the sandwich in half. Mmm. Beautiful. Now that's what I call a steak sandwich. Trust me, serve this sublime sandwich for brunch and you'll put a smile on everyone's face. Next up, my guide to buying the best beef and steaks. If you want the ultimate brunch, you can't do any better than start with a perfect steak. And one man who really knows his steak is master butcher Danny Lidgate. Steak is my favourite type of meat, and I think it's really good to enjoy different varieties of steak. When choosing a steak that you want, you need to look at exactly what you want out of it. For my ultimate steak sandwich, I use the fillet because it's the most tender. The fillet does the least amount of work than all the other muscles. It's tucked away in the rib cage. This means that when you're buying a fillet, it's incredibly soft, like butter. It's the most expensive, but you get what you pay for. There's a wide array of cuts to choose from, all different in taste and texture. If in doubt, ask your butcher. This would be the rump section, where the rump comes from, which is basically the back side. Take the bone out, and what you're left with is a wonderful steak. Rump steak, characteristically, a little bit tougher than the sirloin, or a little bit chewier than the ribeye, but a really strong flavour for the steak. Again, when buying rump, look for the marbling, try and get some fat covering on the steak. You can always cut it off after it's cooked. Rump's one of the best value steaks. I love it thinly cut and flash fried, in stir fries, or simply marinated and whacked on the barbecue. Another great value but delicious cut is the hanger steak, known as the butcher's cut because they often keep it for themselves. It's great marinated, and cooked quickly. With the sirloin, which is basically the back of the animal, a nice sirloin like this, really well marbled, don't buy too lean. So once the sirloin's trimmed up, it looks something like this. Not too much fat, but you need a little bit to cooking it. Next to the sirloin is the rib. Really popular now with ribeyes. Small, nice, really tender, juicy steaks. Really, especially good for barbecuing or grilling, fantastic. Probably my favourite steak would be a ribeye. Ribeye is especially delicious because of the marbling in the meat loads it with flavour. For a full-on steak experience, try the T-bone steak, with a small tender fillet steak on one side of the bone and a larger flavoursome sirloin on the other. Take your butcher's advice and you won't go wrong. The final word has to go to Danny. When buying meat, knowledge really is power, so it's important to ask as many questions about the meat you're buying. Find out the breed, how it's aged, and decide exactly what you want to do each particular job. That should then give you a really amazing end product. The great thing about brunch is there are no rules. The only thing I insist on are it's got to be fuss-free, easy to cook, and so delicious, it puts you in a good mood for the rest of the day. And for me, pancakes always hit the spot. Here are three of my deliciously different recipes certified to liven up your mornings. First up, fluffy blueberry and ricotta pancakes with yoghurt. Start by adding 125 grams of plain flour a teaspoon of baking powder, 
a pinch of salt, a tablespoon of sugar, then create a well in the center. Separate two eggs and add the yolks, keeping the whites for later. Beat the yolks into the flour, pouring in milk gradually to form a smooth batter. Next, fold in 125 grams of creamy ricotta cheese and 100 grams of fresh blueberries. Now whisk your egg whites until they almost reach soft peaks. Then gently fold into the pancake mix, keeping in the air to make sure the pancakes are extra light and really fluffy. Add olive oil and butter into a hot pan, then spoon in the mix to make small pancakes, cooking until golden brown on both sides. To finish, top with Greek yogurt, fresh blueberries, and drizzle over lovely runny honey. Sweet, savory, fruity, and delicious, made in 15 minutes, perfect brunch pancakes. My second simple pancake brunch recipe is succulent crab and mascarpone crepes. For the filling, put cooked white crab meat into a bowl. Add in mascarpone, the zest and juice of a lemon, finely chopped chives, and for a spicy hit, cayenne pepper. Stir and set aside. For the pancake batter, simply add flour, salt, an egg and milk, then whisk into a smooth mixture. Add oil to a hot non-stick pan, ladle in batter to cover the bottom and swirl it around, spreading out nice and thinly. When lovely and golden, flip over. Turn out and spoon the delicious crab mix into the center of the pancake and roll. Finally, sprinkle with some chopped chives and devour. My second pancake recipe, crab and mascarpone crepes, a fantastic easy brunch cooked in minutes. When you want your pancakes sweet and zingy, this recipe is perfect. Coconut pancakes with mango and lime syrup. For the lime syrup, simply add water, cast the sugar, the zest and juice of a lime, and simmer for 10 minutes. To make the easy pancake batter, put flour, baking powder, and desiccated coconut into a bowl. Then crack in an egg. Add coconut milk and whisk into the batter until well combined. Sweeten with runny honey. Now you're ready to fry. Add melted butter to a hot pan. Place in heaped teaspoons of batter. Flip and cook until golden. For a lovely vibrant wake up, so with sliced fresh mango and drizzle over the gorgeous citrusy syrup. Sweet, sticky and utterly irresistible. Ready in under 20 minutes, the ultimate indulgent pancakes. Fast to prepare, easy to make, three effortless recipes guaranteed to bring some sparkle to your brunches. Incredible. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. I'm teaching you all about brunches, the most laid back meal of the week. And if you want to take it easy, having the right equipment makes all the difference. Here's my guide to the best kitchen equipment. Everything you need to know about the basic kit that will get you cooking fantastic food. Chopping boards. For brunch, one of the most useful things is a great chopping board. Get the right one and it'll be your friend for life. I prefer a sort of heavy duty one because they're so much more durable. They can be flipped over the minute you want to go from vegetables to prepping fish or meat. Always keep a little J-cloth underneath that actually stops the board from sliding. Care for your wooden board by rubbing it with oil every so often. Any cooking oil will do. Wooden boards for me are always the best. Easy to clean and long lasting. When you do wash your wooden board, never let it stand in water or put it in the dishwasher as it may split. Buy the best you can afford and take good care of it. For brunch, I love something sweet, and I've always been a fan of classic British crumpets with butter and jam. But once you try cooking them at home, you'll never want to buy them from shops again. This is another great recipe you can stake your life on. It's my homemade crumpet. 
Whether you're cooking for two, three, or even a gang, some of the best brunch dishes are always the simplest. These crumpets are absolutely delicious, and it's a great end to a fantastic brunch. First off, we're going to make the mix. What do you think of growing up? The smell and the taste of amazing crumpet. It never leaves you. To make the mix, the secret is to bring the milk up the ball, but do not boil it. The minute it boils, turn it off and let it sit there. Now, flour in. A nice pinch of salt in. Now, add half a teaspoon of bicarb. That gives it aeration and really lifts the mixture up. All those lovely little holes. A nice pinch of sugar. And then a teaspoon of yeast, dry yeast. Now, once the milk's boiled, turn it off and add some warm water. About 10 tablespoons, 150 ml. That cools down the milk, but more importantly, it doesn't destroy the yeast. Half of the milk in first, stop, and give that a really good mix. Now, the rest of it. You can just see that there's no lumps through there as it drips through the whisk. Now, we're looking for it to double in size and get nice and light. So, pop in a warm place whilst you get on with the delicious topping. Beautiful strawberries, but caramelised, almost like a very quick strawberry jam. Pan on. Just slice these in half. Some sugar, a couple of tablespoons. We're going to take the sugar to a nice light caramel. It's just starting to change colour now. Turn the gas down and we're going to add the strawberries. Beautiful. It's sweating the strawberries down quickly and the caramel's breaking down. And a wonderful glaze on the strawberries. Some lemon grated into the strawberries. Gives it that kind of freshness that really Starts to break down the strawberries. Nice. Gas up. <laughs> smells incredible. Some lemon juice. Touch of balsamic vinegar. In. That gives it that really nice, delicious tartness. Now, off it goes. As the strawberries start to cool down, it will naturally thicken and set beautifully. Nice. Now for the crumpet. It's almost doubled in size, but be very careful you don't knock the bowl because it can sort of push out all that air. It's aerated, it's nice, it's light. Just see the texture. She's ready to go. Touch of oil in. In we go. Instead of making normal small crumpets, I'm making a giant one, ideal for sharing. Now, turn the gas down. You can just start to see a traditional crumpet-style cooking process. We want those nice, tiny little holes on top and that crispy, crunchy base. Right, now it's time to add the butter. Just slide the butter down the back. That gives it a really nice, nutty flavour at the end. Fish nice. And flip. Useful. Take that out. Take the jam, spoon it over. The secret is for the juice to sort of run inside all those little holes. Think of that tartness of the balsamic vinegar. The strawberries, beautifully soft and almost pureed, wrapped in that delicious caramel. Now, finish that with a nice ball of creme fraiche. Let that sit there. And that is an amazing way of finishing off a traditional brunch with something sweet, something delicious, and something you're dying to tuck into. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. Fruit can be a great healthy option for brunch, and knowing how to get the best out of it can make all the difference. 
first up, how to peel and cut a mango the easy way. Holding its stalk end up, cut either side of the stone, cut all the way into the flesh, making squares without cutting through the skin. Then turn it inside out and carefully cut your pieces off. A great tip to check if a pineapple is ripe is to pull a leaf out from the top. If it comes away easily, it's ripe and ready for slicing. My tip to get the flesh out of a kiwi is to simply cut the fruit in half and scoop it out with a teaspoon. Try it, it really works. If you have fruit that's not perfectly ripe, the tip is to put a banana in a paper bag, then add your unripe fruit. Put it in a dark place and the banana will speed up the ripening process of the other fruit. You can make a great fruit puree to accompany a brunch pancake or a crumpet in a blender. To clean it afterwards, add a cup of warm water and run the machine for a few seconds. Empty out, then simply repeat with a drop of washing up liquid, then rinse. Follow my ultimate cookery course, bursting with valuable lessons, top tips, and 100 recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking. Packed with cooking tips, information, and 100 recipes to stake your life on. So, sit back and enjoy my delicious, simple suppers. One of my essential mantras for becoming a better cook is it's all about building your confidence. And the way to do that is with practice. The key is to have a repertoire of easy dishes you want to cook and eat time and time again. And soon, you'll be on your way to becoming a kitchen demon. My first dish keeps it simple, but delivers big time on flavor. So it's sure to become a regular quick supper fix. Spicy tuna fish cakes. I love this recipe. Why? because it turns this humble ingredient, a can of tuna, into something delicious. Just open up and drain the tuna into a sieve. Just slightly flake that. Don't press it too hard, otherwise you'll dry out the tuna. Now, these are water chestnuts. Just slice them nice and thin. You can buy them anywhere, any supermarket. Chestnuts in. Fresh ginger. Get rid of that rough skin on the outside. By grating the ginger, you get to get all that really nice sort of juice in. Take your spring onions and just slice on an angle. I like the texture of the water chestnut with a spring onion. A touch of fresh coriander. Lovely. Next, remove the seeds from a chilli to reduce its heat without losing any flavour and finely chop. Chilies in. Kaffir lime leaves. Roll them up nice and tight. Run your knife down the centre once and just chop. And that makes the fish cake nice and fragrant. Touch of salt, touch of pepper. Fish sauce. Just lightly season the tuna to bind all those wonderful ingredients. Two whole eggs. And give that a nice little whisk. And then add your eggs. Get your hands in there and start mixing. Mm. Get the mixture, roll it from hand to hand with the palm, pat them down nicely. To cook, add a little groundnut oil to a hot pan. At the face of a clock, we're going to go from 12 all the way around. First one in. These fish cakes only take a few minutes to cook, so keeping track of the order they go in the pan means you know which one to turn first. Give the pan a nice, gentle little shake. Make sure that nothing's sticking to the bottom. Spatula, two fingers on top, turn them over. Beautiful. That crackling noise is something you always want because the tuna's already cooked, so we're just lightly frying them to get the nice crisp outside and gently take them out. 
the smell. Incredible. Let them sit there. We're going to make a really nice, delicious, simple dipping sauce. Start off a little pinch of sugar. Fish sauce, two tablespoons. That gives it the saltiness. One tablespoon of rice wine vinegar and some fresh lime juice. Squeeze all that lime in there. Your fresh coriander. Lots of coriander and in. Give that a little mix. And then you have the most amazing spicy tuna fish cakes. Who would have thought something as delicious as that can come out of a can? A simple supper in minutes that's so mouth-wateringly easy and delicious, you're guaranteed to cook it again and again. When it comes to simple cooking, there are two basic bits of kit I'm never without that will save you time and effort in the kitchen. A grater and a peeler. The swivel peeler, a stainless steel one. Absolutely incredible. It's almost like a lifesaver in the kitchen because they are so quick, so light. Swivel blade, so you've got so much more flexibility. You can actually go around the vegetable. And we call it a speed peeler in the professional kitchen because it does literally, absolutely, rapidly peels your vegetables. You have minimal waste. Good peelers cost from a couple of quid and are great for everything from peeling veg to finely slicing cheese and making shards of chocolate. A good comfortable grip and a sharp stainless steel blade ensures you'll always work fast. The box grater is another great versatile kitchen tool and with its planes for coarse grating, fine grating and super fine, as well as blades for slicing, it's perfect for everything from pureeing ginger and zesting lemons to shredding onions super small so they can caramelise in a flash and be sure to get a solid handle to hold it firm. And it's got such volume inside, it doesn't crush anything up. So I always prefer to grate onto a tray or into a bowl, so you don't have to move it again. Grating onto the board, you've always got to lift it up and place it in. So place the grater into a bowl and grate. Two simple but essential speedy bits of kit, guaranteed to make your life in the kitchen easier. Bread is a brilliant base for delicious, super fast lunches and suppers. Here are three of my deliciously simple recipes that transform a humble bit of bread into a gastronomic treat. First up, flatbreads with fennel and feta. Add olive oil to a flatbread. Then place in a hot frying pan and toast until crisp and golden on both sides. These deliciously versatile breads are made without yeast and are available in good supermarkets and local Middle Eastern shops. Next, thinly slice fresh fennel and scatter over the toasted flatbread. Then, toast aromatic fennel seeds in a hot, dry pan and sprinkle on top. Crumble over wonderfully tangy feta cheese. Finish with a drizzle of sweet and sticky pomegranate molasses. Bread transformed before your eyes. Flatbreads with fennel and feta, simple, delicious, and ready to eat in minutes. My next recipe that turns a hunk of bread into a stunning dish is bruschetta with garlic, tomatoes, capers, and pecorino. Start by slicing a baguette diagonally to get a large surface area so it holds more of the delicious topping. Drizzle the bread with extra virgin olive oil, then place it oil side down onto a scorching hot griddle. When the bread is beautifully charred, remove and rub with a peeled clove of garlic, paying attention to the edges. Next, half sweet cherry tomatoes and rub the juices into the toasted garlic bread. Then simply crush on top. Next, slice and scatter over tangy, caper berries and use a veg peeler to add shavings of salty pecorino cheese. Finally, drizzle with extra virgin olive oil and add a twist of black pepper. Fantastic fresh flavours in the flash of a griddle pan. Toast has never tasted so good. Perfect for a simple light supper or an easy lunch. My next dish is a cannellini bean crostini with anchovy and olive oil. First, for the topping, heat olive oil in a frying pan. Add tin cannellini beans along with the juices. 
Once heated, gently mash the beans with a fork. Then add sliced black olives, roughly chopped parsley, and a splash of sherry vinegar. Season and leave on a gentle heat. Next, half a fresh ciabatta and splash with extra virgin olive oil. Heat a griddle pan until smoking and toast the bread oil side down, pressing it into the pan to char evenly. To serve, top the toasted ciabatta with a cannellini bean mixture and finish with chopped anchovies. Packed with bold flavours, so easy you can always make it blindfolded. Ready in under 10 minutes, but eaten in seconds. Three different breads, three fantastic recipes, proof that even when you're pressed for time, you can still eat like a king. Incredible. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. These are my perfect TV dinners. Next up, my guide to getting the best ingredients for your money. My shopping mantra is very simple. First, rely on your senses. Make sure whatever you're buying, it looks, smells, and really feels good. And if you get the chance to taste it before you buy it, then do it. Second, is to recognise that knowledge is absolutely crucial. The more you know about where your ingredients are from and how they're produced, the better. So, don't be scared. Ask lots of questions and learn. And when you want a simple supper, herbs are perfect to use in your cooking. They add vibrancy and an amazing depth of flavour, and once you get the hang of them, they are so quick and simple to use. And one woman who really knows these chef's best friends is expert herb grower Lorraine Melton. I love herbs. I love the way you can cook with them. I love the smell of them. She's been growing an incredible array of herbs in the wet Cambridgeshire countryside for over 20 years and can smell a bay from a basil at 50 paces. We grow about 150 varieties of herbs. It's always interesting to grow new varieties, see what they taste like, see what they smell like. It gets a bit addictive after a while. Broadly speaking, you get harder herbs and softer herbs. Softer herbs are things like parsley, basil, rocket, coriander. We grow um, two main types of parsley. We've got flat leaf parsley and curly parsley. Flavour-wise, I think they're very similar, although a lot of people would say that the flat leaf parsley has got a stronger, more aromatic flavour. This is your common basil, sweet Genovese. This is um, a purple variety called Reuben. We do Greek basil, Thai basil, holy basil. When you're looking for a basil, you want a bright, fresh basil, nice leaves, no blemishes, and nice, strong stems. It's got a lot of oils in it, and it's very strong smelling. It just tastes of summer, basil. Lorraine certainly knows her stuff, and she's right. Soft herbs are delicate, so for maximum flavor, always use them at the end of cooking, or simply add as they are to cold dishes. Here are my top five soft herbs that I could never live without. Basil, as Lorraine said, it comes in many types, all with an amazing sweet pungent flavor. Great blitzed in pestos, sprinkled whole over mozzarella, and showing its versatility, it even makes a wonderful ice cream. Parsley, beautifully earthy and intensely fresh. Use both the leaves and the stem for great depth of flavor in savory dressing, soups, and salads. Coriander. For an amazing hint of citrus, often used in Thai dishes, coriander is perfect in curries and chutneys, but it bruises easily, so treat it with care. Tarragon, a staple of French cooking. This has long, soft green leaves and a distinct aniseed flavor, great with chicken or in rich, creamy sauces. Finally, chervil. Both mild and sweet, a perfect pairing with fish, and incredible mix simply with melted butter for a quick sauce. Those are my favorite soft herbs. What about the hard ones? The harder ones tends to be um, a more woody plant. Things like thyme, rosemary. So you've got your common thyme, which is your ordinary, general, bog-standard cooking thyme. And then you've got things like lemon thyme. We do an orange thyme, which is actually one of my favourites. It smells like thyme, but it's got a deep, sort of musky scent as well, which is just going to give you a slightly different flavour in your dish. Hard herbs, like thyme, can take more intense cooking than soft herbs, so they're great in stews, roasts, or pan frying. Choose the right one, and you can add wonderful depth of flavor to your dishes. Here are my top five I use day in and day out. Rosemary, amazingly robust with great bittersweet green leaves. It's a classic paired with lamb, delicious sprinkled over speciality breads like focaccia, or great as toppings for fruity sorbets. Lorraine's favorite, thyme. A heady, aromatic, pungent herb which adds delicious flavor to a Sunday roast. It's amazing with wild mushrooms and is perfect in marinades. Oregano, 
warm and full of delicious aromatic oils. A staple of great Italian dishes and perfect sprinkled on pizzas or in pasta sauces. Sage, a strong tasting herb with a deliciously bitter flavor, incredible in stuffings and with rich meats like pork or duck. Finally, bay, bittersweet and spicy. It's delicious simmered in soups, stocks and risottos and just as good dried or fresh. Growing herbs is a lot easier than people think it is. On window boxes, in balconies, and it's great. You can just open your window, put your hand out and snip some off. When you're out looking for herbs, make sure they look nice and healthy, no blemishes, stems look strong. They should just spring back, so they're nice springy sort of herbs. Smell, obviously, is quite important. Not all things smell, but obviously, if you think it's one that's going to smell like lemon thyme, it should have a nice, fresh lemon scent. And obviously, the final one is taste. You can tip a bit off and taste your herbs and you can see what they taste like then. Whether bought from a supermarket or picked from your window box, herbs are a great way to add fresh flavours to your dishes. Perfect for delicious, simple suppers. Even if you've got a super busy lifestyle, it doesn't mean missing out on delicious desserts. They just have to be simple to make. When it comes to cooking at home, puddings should always be a pleasure and never a chore. And homemade puds are 100% guaranteed to impress. My next recipe has only two main ingredients, but simplicity doesn't mean food can't taste out of this world. Incredible griddled pineapple with spiced caramel. If you're making a dessert for one or two, it's gonna be quick and easy. This sumptuous, delicious griddled pineapple fits the bill perfectly. Pineapple. Way of testing, it's nice and ripe. The top of the leaves come out. Perfect, ready to go. Always cut a pineapple with a straighted edge knife. Slice off the bottom. Turn it back over and slice the top part. Now, keep that for later. Look at the core, the center of the pineapple, and slice down, directly in half. Slice that in half. Take each quarter and slice them. It smells incredible. Lay it down flat and just slice that core off. So you've got this perfect sort of boat of pineapple. Slice underneath, but stop as you get right at the end. Slicing around the skin will make the pineapple easier to eat, but leaving it attached gives you more control as it cooks. Next, heat a griddle pan as hot as you can. Start off in the corner and push it down. So you really mark the pineapple. Two minutes on each side, and then just turn them. Really nice colour there, look at that. Beautiful. I'm going to sprinkle them with a little touch of sugar. It's going to glaze them. Now, slice the top. Take out these beautiful glazed slices of pineapple. Look at that. Next up, the spiced caramel. Now, start off with your pan, nice and hot. Sprinkle four tablespoons of sugar in there. Just flatten it. Then, add the seeds from a fresh vanilla pod. In a small dusting of Chinese five spice. Never stir caramel. Let it sort of bubble and transform. Here she goes. Now I've got the color. I want it. That's the perfect colour. Off with the gas. In with the butter. And then a couple of tablespoons of cream. Lovely. And then give that a little whisk. Add the rest of your cream. Nice. And just drip that spicy caramel over your pineapple. Mmm. Wow. Simple, elegant, and seriously impressive. Griddle pineapple with spiced caramel. A delicious treat all to yourself to taste even better shared. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. First up, the proper way to chop fresh herbs to get maximum flavor. Chopping herbs, the secret is to chop them, not bruise them. Now, basil. This is a soft herb, so treat it with some respect. When people go mad chopping herbs, all the goodness comes out on the board. I want the goodness left inside the basil. Place them all inside one another 
with the largest leaf at the bottom, and it's almost like rolling a cigar. Large one at the bottom, small ones in the centre, and then look, place them down together, and just roll them. Nice and gently, don't bruise them. Step one, rolled, ready to slice. Sharp knife, imperative. Fingers tucked in. The bottom part of your knuckle is the guide between you and the herbs. That there stops you from cutting your finger. Really important to get comfortable with the knife and just practice rolling the knife across the board and relaxing that wrist. It's all in the wrist action. So, herbs up, fingernails tucked underneath and just up and down, up and down. And there you have a chopped basil that's not bruised and smelling very fragrant. Right, coriander. So you get the bunch of coriander, hold it down, and just lightly shave the leaves off the stalks. Bunch them up together, and then just, again, let the knife do the work. Tuck the fingernails in and just chop once, and once only. Don't hack it, just chop it. You can always identify when you've bruised the herb, when you've removed the herbs off the board, and there's a big green patch. Mmm, full of flavour, and none of the goodness is left on the chopping board. A great tip for using leftover herbs, simply chop finely, mix into butter, roll up in cling film and freeze. Then when you want a herby hit, cut into slices and melt over steaks, chicken or veg. Asparagus is great for a simple supper. To prepare, always remove the lower woody stem by gently bending, and the asparagus will snap at the perfect point. Then boil or steam and serve with a little of my herb butter. For a cracking soft boiled egg, simply place your egg in boiling water, add a splash of vinegar and cook for exactly eight minutes. Then plunge into ice water. The vinegar helps the shell peel off easily and the ice water stops the egg from cooking, giving you the perfect runny yolk. For fuss-free salad dressings, simply add the ingredients into a jam jar. Screw the lid on tightly and shake to combine in seconds. There's no need to wash up a whisk, and the jar's ready-made to store any leftovers. Follow my ultimate cookery course, bursting with valuable lessons, top tips, and 100 recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking.